What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Martian MMA Podcast. I'm your host, and my name is John. And this week, we will be analyzing, predicting, and discussing the betting odds on the UFC London card going down this Saturday afternoon, headlined by Darren Till versus Jorge Masvidal. At the end of the program, we will also quickly recap the UFC Wichita card that went down this past Saturday, headlined by Derek Lewis versus Junior Dos Santos. But starting things off in London, we have ourselves a 13-fight card that is starting off at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and the main card kicks off at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. This event will be broadcast exclusively on ESPN Plus, the 5th ESPN Plus card of this year already, and this is the seventh of nine straight weekends with UFC. We are in the home stretch of this streak of cards in the UFC. It's been a lot of work, uh, you, you know, dissecting every matchup, but it's also been a lot of fun. And we've also had some great cards along the way. And we got another one this weekend. It's stacked from top to bottom with really good matchups. The UFC really brought it with this London card this year. And especially towards the top of the card, we have some really, really close matchups between some high-level guys like Leon Edwards and Gunnar Nelson, uh, two of the best well-rounded martial artists on the card, I believe. And uh, in the main event, we have Darren Till taking on Jorge Masvidal, two of some of the best strikers at welterweight. So we got two welterweight matchups at the top of this card, along with uh, matchups in all weight divisions throughout the card that are going to be really good. So we're going to start things off discussing these matchups right away. To start things off in the featherweight division, we have Nad Nitnermani, who is 12-2, taking on Mike Grundy, who is 11-1. The opening betting line for this one was Nad Nurmani as the minus 245 favorite to Grundy at plus 175. Now, I think a little bit of early action came in on Nad Nurmani, but after people started watching tape, that line started sinking towards Mike Grundy massively. Right now, we see over on our affiliated sportsbook, fivedimes.eu, Mike Grundy, the plus 115 underdog to Nad Nurmani at minus 135. See, if you look at this line movement, uh, Grundy was up to plus 200, you know, it looks like March 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and then the past seven days, or the past four days, excuse me, he has just been steadily, steadily sinking. I've seen a lot of people talking about him on MMA Twitter, a lot of, you know, well-established MMA bettors out there are backing Grundy in this spot, and I can really understand why. He's uh, got some really great wrestling, if you watched uh, tape on him. uh, You know, it's not often that you see a British guy with good wrestling, but I'm telling you, this guy's got solid wrestling, solid takedowns, and, uh, you know, I've actually been hearing some people say that he's one of, like, the best wrestlers in all of Britain in the past, you know, uh, from Olympic to, you know, co- collegiate to, uh, you know, MMA at all. I don't even think they have college wrestling in, in um, I'm almost certain they don't have college wrestling in, in Britain, but still, one of the best uh, wrestlers to come out of Britain in the past, you know, decade people were talking about. Now, that could be a bit of an exaggeration, who knows, but like I said, he's got some of the some of the best takedowns I've seen from a British guy. But he's taken on an opponent, Nad Naramani, who's got some good takedown skills of his own. He's uh, definitely been working on them in his past couple of fights, and it shows he's been training with the guys over at Team Alpha Male. And that's going to play a huge factor into this matchup. He's training every day with guys like Darren Elkins, Andre Feely, Clay Guida, uh, Chad Mendez, and Cody Garbrandt, guys who are you know top level bantamweight and featherweights. And guys with serious wrestling pedigrees, a lot of them with collegiate and high school experience, and then guys like Andre Feely, who just learned wrestling along the way and have had real success with it in the UFC. So that train, honestly, I think you know those five guys I mentioned are probably some of the best gr- uh, group of training partners you could have in preparation for fighting a wrestler like Mike Grundy. So some of the, the, the advantage that I see for Naramani in this fight is going to be the striking. Uh, you know, even though he's not perfect on the feet, he's definitely the much better striker. It seems like Mike Grundy is just, he blitzes to close the distance to get that takedown as soon as he can. Now, he doesn't really set up his takedowns that well with punches. Um, he kind of just dives in for takedowns and blasts double legs, which works a lot of the time because he does have very good entries and powerful uh, double legs and powerful takedown skills. 
But you know that's gonna be that's gonna be tough to get those takedowns against a, a guy with real wrestling skills like Naramani. I imagine he's gonna have to work to set up those takedowns to get Naramani down. And if this fight stays in the feed, if Naramani is able to stuff those takedowns, I see him winning this fight pretty decisively. We, I mean, you know, Mike Grundy could surprise us and show off some really good striking skills, but we haven't really seen him strike much on tape. Like I said, the fight starts on the feet, and within 10 seconds, he's shooting for a takedown usually. So it's hard to get a feel of his striking. I imagine that it's not too good considering that he's such a high-level wrestler and he never really strikes in the cage. But you never really know. So, you know, even even though the, the, a lot of public money has come in on Mike Grundy the past, you know, a uh, couple days, uh, you know, around plus 150 or higher, I'd say you got a good price on Grundy. But the people betting Grundy at plus 150 or below, I do not agree with at all. You know, this guy, it's his debut in the UFC. He's, you know, he's claimed to have good wrestling for, for Br British wrestlers or British fighters, excuse me. But that really doesn't compare to almost any uh, average wrestler from America. You know, we've seen guys like Chris Fishgold on the uh, regional UK scene in Cage Warriors, you know, doing really well with his wrestling. And then he comes to the UFC and he looks like he doesn't have that great of a ground game. So, you know, it's certainly possible that Grundy could come in here looking great on tape and then, you know, lay an egg in his debut against a tough guy, a tough tested guy like Naramani. But, you know, Naramani, like I said, not perfect on the feet. He he did have get uh, touched up a little bit on the feet by Khalil Taha, who is not a really big uh, featherweight himself. So, and he, he seems a little bit comfortable to get hit, you know, he, in, especially in his fight, um, the most recent fight with Anderson Dos Santos, too. He was getting, you know, he was willing to trade in the pocket and eat some punches in that fight, so... This is a close matchup. It really is. It really depends if if Naramani is able to stuff the takedowns. If he is, I really see him being able to you know win a decision in this one. Maybe getting some offensive takedowns of his own, putting Grundy on his back, or you know just winning the striking in this one to a decision. So the pick is going to be Naramani to get this one by decision. Next fight in the women's band or flyweight division, excuse me, we have Priscilla Cachoeira, who is eight and one, taking on Molly McCann, who is seven and two. The opening betting line for this one was Molly McCann minus 145, Priscilla Cachoeira at plus 105. Since then, a lot of money coming in on Molly McCann, pushing her to minus 210 to Cachoeira up to plus 175. So both these women, uh, you know, uh, looked decent on the on the regional scene and then you know got maybe got uh called up to the ufc a little bit too early both of them had pretty rough ufc debuts mcmahon getting uh or mccann excuse me getting um taken down and submitted by jillian robertson or robertson and priscilla cachoeira getting absolutely dominated by the current champion of the division Val valentina shevchenko you know uh, Molly McCann's loss was a lot worse to Cachoeira's, in my opinion. Even though Cachoeira got her ass beat in that fight, you know, she's fighting a world champion. She made her debut against, you know, the number one ranked uh, flyweight at the time, one of the most well rounded females in the UFC. So there's no shame in that loss at all. They were throwing her to the wolves in that matchup, and it really showed. McCann was given a fight where, you know, she, uh, even though uh, Robertson proved that she's the be better fighter, it was certainly a winnable fight. You know, Robertson is not indestructible by any means. She makes a lot of mistakes in there. But, you know, uh, both of these women have, you know, pretty untechnical striking. I think McMahon has a slight edge in technique on the feet, but they both really wing punches. They, they both, you know, uh, have, you know, pretty iffy fit footwork. I think Cachoeira actually has really bad footwork. She kind of, even though McMahon, McCann is not a wrestler of her own right, Cachoeira gets so off balance and her footwork is so bad that she leaves herself open to the takedown you know McCann could dump her on the ground and land some ground and pound or try to work her top game I'm sure that McCann has been working her jujitsu ever since she got you know embarrassed in her last fight showing her lack of skill on the ground I think she also missed weight in that fight too so you know look for her to uh you know be a little uh be a little iffy on the scales to, uh in her in this fight again you know if she misses weight that could be a, a symbol that she's having really really tough cuts down to 125 and the 35 division might be better for her her nickname is meatball anyway and her her, her body looks like a, she's eating too many meatballs so uh you know neither of these women are very high level you know i i, I give props to cachoeira for for staying in there as long as she did against shevchenko you know she like i said she was getting her ass absolutely whooped in there but there was really no quit in her 
And, um, you know, this is a close matchup, but I got to give it to uh, to Molly McCann in this one. I think she'll keep it on the feet. She, she's a little more technical. She'll probably win the boxing exchanges. And she could even maybe hurt Cachoeira on the feet in this one, possibly get a finish. But I got to lean with decision, and uh, I think the McCann will get it done. Next fight in the featherweight division, we have Dan Ige, who is 10 and 2, taking on Danny Henry, who is 12 and 2. The opening betting line for this one opened up Dan Ige, the minus 105 underdog to Danny Henry at plus, minus 135. Interesting line. Since then, the line has flipped and more money coming in Ige's way. He's now down, down to minus 145. Danny Henry up to plus 125. So first time seeing that uh, Danny Henry opened the favorite in this one. Pretty uh, pretty amazing that that happened. It's a pretty huge recency bias. You know, Danny Henry coming off of a very impressive win against Hakeem Duwado. He uh, you know, Duado, I think, was coming into that fight undefeated. He was making his debut in the UFC, and I'm, I'm pretty sure he was a pretty sizable favorite in that fight. And, and Danny Henry was able to floor him with a punch and choke him out, uh, you know, within 40 seconds. So really impressive win from Henry in that fight. Except for, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get a really... Uh, full understanding of Danny Henry's skills. You know, he fought Daniel Tamer and he looked, you know, pretty bad to start that fight. He goes getting rocked by Daniel Tamer. He was get you know, his defense does not look very good. He was getting hit with punches nonstop. He does have a good chin though cuz like I said, he was getting hit with bombs, but he sta he stayed in there. He didn't get finished. He withstood the storm from uh, Daniel Tamer and then was able to uh, win the the latter half of that fight and win on the judges scorecard. So Definitely an impressive comeback from Danny Henry, even though it's uh, over one of the lowest level guys on the roster, Daniel Tamer, who's actually probably been cut uh, since his last loss. But, uh, you know, like I said, it's a hard it's hard to get a, a feel of, of Danny Henry's full skill because we haven't, you know, seen him defend ta uh, takedowns. And, uh, you know, that's what's going to come down to a lot in this matchup. Dan Ige is a, a really... Uh, high level black belt he's got good takedowns he's relentless with the takedown man he'll pressure you non-stop he's good at scrambling you know and uh, he, he'll get you he'll put you on your back and he'll keep you there he'll go for submissions he'll land ground and pound he's got a really well well-rounded uh, ground game He's got some decent striking to go along with it, but I think that Henry will honestly have the edge in the striking in this one. It really comes down to if Henry is able to stuff the takedowns of Dan Ige. You know, if when uh, Dan Ige fought Julio Arce, Arce was able to stuff those takedowns, and then he he punished uh, Ar uh, Ige on the feet, winning the decision victory in that fight. So if Henry is able to stuff the shots and land the, the harder punches on the feet, I, I think that he will win this one. You know, Henry's got pretty good cardio, I'd say, you know, even though... Uh, like I said, he was getting uh, hurt really badly the first six or seven minutes of that fight versus Tamer, and then was able to withstand all that, and you know, uh, still have the uh, the gas tank and you know the willpower to to win that last half of the fight to get the win on the scorecard. So, um, I think the Ige will get the takedowns in this one. I just think his wrestling is too good. If Henry is able to stuff a few shots, I think Ige will be looking to chain wrestle, sh string together a couple different takedowns to eventually muscle uh, Henry down to the mat. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be a good fight in this one. I expect some good scram scrambles, and you know I think that uh, Dan Ige, you know people are you know questioning his cardio a little bit, saying that he looked uh, pretty gassed out in round three versus. Uh, Jordan Griffin to say he looked the same against uh, Julio Arce. Both of those fights were fights with a lot of grappling in them, where he had you know constant scrambles. He he was you know losing position and getting top position and getting scr you know that, that's an exhausting type of fight. It's much much different than a striking fight. So uh, I don't think his cardio is that bad at all. I think that Dan Ige will will win this fight by decision. Next fight is taking place in the well, middleweight division. We have Tom Brees, who is 11-1, taking on Ian Heinish, who is 12-1. The betting line for this one opened up. Tom Brees as the minus 160 favorite to Ian Heinish at plus 120. Right now, we're seeing Tom Brees at minus 125 to Ian Heinish at plus 105. So, uh, 
little bit of money, a little bit more money coming in Heinish's way in this one. He actually shot up to you know plus one thirty five. It's the highest he got around a week ago. But then steady money has been coming in on him on the past couple of days, uh, especially today. You know he was up, he was plus one twenty earlier today when I checked, and now he's down to plus one hundred five. So a lot of action coming in on Heinish's way. I, I really don't blame people in this one. I, I I was really really impressed with Ian Heinish, his debut. You know. He came in against a really experienced, uh, high-level black belt, a, a guy who's got real good wins in the UFC, in C Cesar Mutanch Ferreira. He came into that fight on like six days' notice. He was in good shape, physically and mentally. You know, you know how you know it, it's hard to to come into that uh, a fight on that short notice, knowing you might not be in your best physical condition, knowing you're against going against a proven UFC guy with a, a, a wicked ground game, uh, and you know that didn't scare Heinish one bit. He actually out grappled the third degree black belt in Cesar Ferreira. You know he was going for kimuras and arm bars and trying all types of submissions on on uh, Ferreira, which was shocking to see. You know he uh, he he just got really. I think his his mental belief in himself is you know one of the the biggest factors he's got going for him right now. You know this guy was apparently like a drug kingpin in in Spain. And you know, serve time in Rikers Island, and you know all this crazy shit in his life, and now he's totally reformed himself. He's a you know a well-disciplined athlete. The dude is in killer shape. I saw a picture of him earlier this week, and the dude looked like you know insane. And uh, I'm just really looking forward to seeing this guy fight again. I, like I said, I was so impressed with his debut. He's got really good get-ups. You know, he's he's wicked strong. You know, he he's not he doesn't have the greatest takedown defense. He's willing to get taken down, but he he'll get right back up. Uh, but he's fighting, you know, a, a really good uh, grappler of his own. Uh, Tom Brees has got really solid jiu-jitsu. He uh, hasn't competed much in, in MMA over the past couple years, but he's been staying busy in uh, doing all types of uh, jiu-jitsu competitions. Uh, you know, he fought uh, Polaris and uh, EBI. He went against... Vinny Magalhaes, who, if you don't know, is one of the best submission grapplers in the world and had, like, you know, a, a pretty good match with him, a, a six- or seven-minute match where he, you know, threatened with a, a few of his own submissions. He didn't play straight defense like a lot of MMA guys do when they go to compete in jiu-jitsu. He was, you know, attacking with some own stuff. It looks like he has, you know, a, a good understanding of leg locks. And, uh, you know, I don't think that that will play much of a factor in this fight because if Cesar Ferreira was not able to uh, submit Ian Heinish, then I doubt Tom Reese will, but, you know, Matanche gassed out pretty hard in that fight. He looked like he was broke mentally after the first round. You know, Ian Heinish really almost caught uh, Ferreira with an arm bar in, the, in round one. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Heinish actually did some damage to uh, Ferreira's arm and he just refused to tap, but... Tom Brees is going to be the better striker in this matchup. I think Heinish, you know, makes a little more mistakes on the feed. He's a little more reckless. Sometimes he'll throw flying knees or spinning kicks when he has no business throwing them. And, you know, that's something that he's got to work on. Uh, I remember, what, you know, watching his debut fight. And I remember a few times he, you know, would go to throw a flying knee and get taken down or go to throw a spinning kick and get countered, you know. So he kind of makes a little, a few mistakes on the feet. But, uh, you know, Brees is not perfect either. He's got solid boxing. He's got a... Uh, good inside leg kick but he also gets hit a lot you know he saw that in the Sean Strickland fight and uh you know something about Tom Breeze is in that last the uh, last round round of that Strickland fight it was a razor thin fight it was probably one run going into the third the first three minutes were real competitive and then Tom Breeze got real desperate diving for a takedown you know grasping for a leg and you know eventually lost that battle for the takedown and Strickland ended up on top and won that decision so that pro that last 90 seconds going for that takedown probably cost Tom Breeze the fight in that matchup so and Tom Breeze was uh was supposed to fight um let's see uh, Cesar, I think it was, no, 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 he was supposed to fight, let's see, Ol Oluwali Bambuse, that's who it is, Le uh, two years ago in London, you know, one of the lower level guys in the division, I think the, you know, it was a kind of a gimme fight for him, and apparently Tom Breeze pulled out of that fight uh, the day of due to personal reasons, never really, uh, I think, fully disclosed why, but, you know, I think people uh, chalked it up to him being nervous and him having, you know, crazy anxiety. Um, you know, so we're going, you know, it's it's kind of trivial to compare these two, but you're going against a guy who, you know, served time in jail, 
for you know a serious felony was able to go out get out of jail completely reverse his life and is now a high level mixed martial artist going against a guy who you know got scared uh in front of uh, in front of his hometown crowd, the day of a fight against you know a, a certainly lower level uh, guy in the welterweight or the middleweight division at the time, so that is very alarming. You know, I don't think I'm, I'm sure that you know Tom Breeze won't, won't be you know won't, that won't be a factor in this fight. I'm sure he's going to be game as fuck in this fight, ready for Ian Heinish. But I just think Ian Heinish wants it more. I think he's got uh, you know he's the more physical fighter. He's strong. He like that the way he debuted on six days notice and you know won the th that three round fight showed good cardio in that fight, which is super impressive. I, I gotta pick Heinish, uh, and you know that that's that dog money is coming in on Heinish. So a lot of people are there with me. So the pick is going to be Ian Heinish to get this one done, probably by decision. Next fight in the light heavyweight division, we have Sapabek Safarov, who is eight and two, taking on Nick Negramanu, who is nine and zero. Oh. The opening betting line for this one was Negramanu at minus two fifteen, Safarov at plus one sixty five. Looking over at Five Dimes .eu right now, we see Negramanu at minus 165 safarov at plus 145 i'm probably butchering this guy's name nikolai negromanu a lot of syllables in that so we're, we're doing our best i know mr negromanu is listening so sorry my man and good luck this weekend but that's beside the point both of these guys are uh you know pretty sloppy fighters you know negromanu has fought uh straight bums so far man you look at his recent opponents records and they're terrible you know 2 and 15 was one of his opponents recent records so uh, that's nothing against the guy himself you know a lot of the times you know people have fight shitty shitty opponents they have weak strength of schedules and people you know take that as like a take it personally like they think it's something like the the fighter is hand picking the his opponents you know he probably signed a contract to a promotion and they match him with whoever they want to he doesn't have any say in who he wants to fight so that's not that's not his fault at all he's you know coming from uh some some strange country romania bulgaria yeah romania so you know the the level of uh, of competition and the the amount of fighters over there is probably pretty low so um we he's uh you know he he looked uh, even fighting those bums i don't think he looked too impressive you know he fought really safe he fought you know a little bit you know tentative conservative at times where he was taking down these bums and you know uh hitting them with some ground and pound and then eventually getting a choke he it seems like he's got some some good uh, submission skills you know most of his wins are coming by some uh, submission you know uh, he's got a few tkos and ground and pounds in there as well but mostly submissions uh you know, it's uh, and he's fighting uh, Sapabek Safarov, who is you know a very very beatable fighter. We've seen him in the UFC uh, twice so far, and he's lost both of those fights, and against guys who are you know n not the highest level. John Volante and Tyson Pedro getting knocked out by both of them. Or, excuse me, Pedro uh, Camorred him, but you know in both of those fights he he proved that he was you know he's super hittable. He doesn't do well against a jab. He doesn't do well against leg kicks. It seems like he's got a bum knee or something like that. It, it, apparently, it's a, a repetitive problem in his fights that he his his knee or leg keeps giving out. Really funny, actually. If you that John Volante versus Sapabek Safarov fight is one of the funniest fights I've ever seen. It's just it's just a total shit show. In between the in between the rounds, they see uh, you know you see Safarov's knee giving out in, in the first round. In between rounds, the doctor comes into the octagon, starts inspecting his knee, and asking Safarov to do squats in between rounds to prove that his knee is good enough to fight Keith Peterson eventually comes over and says come on come on we gotta fight we gotta fight let's go let's go get out of here and the doctors leave the cage and then he ends up getting finished that round so one thing to look for is that Negramandu throws some pretty hard leg kicks but we you know with the limited footage there is of him fighting uh, you know these lower level guys in these strange arenas in Romania you can see that he throws hard leg kicks uh, but you know this that doesn't that doesn't mean that he's gonna win this fight for sure you know Safarov throws bombs he throws hard he's got he's got decent boxing of his own he's got some neat, uh, good body kicks he can hit takedowns of his own but uh, you know he's he's certainly flawed on the feet you know he's pretty reckless coming into exchanges he leaves his chin wide out there he's not very skilled in the clinch uh, his footwork is not very good so he he's got a lot of flaws in the feet does Safarov. 
But, uh, you know, he's he's a tough, tough motherfucker. It didn't matter that he was getting lit up with punches and his knee was giving out on him. He was still marching forward. Uh, he's a, he's a, you know, a different breed coming, uh, coming out of Russia. But, you know, uh, if I got a, you know, gun to my head picking a fighter, I, I got to side with, uh, Negromanu in this one. But, uh, you know, the, the value I think, uh, in the betting window could be on Safarov. Uh, you know, if you, I think I, I bet him earlier this week, maybe plus 175. He was, uh, you know, higher in this, uh, in this week than he is right now, plus 145. But still, uh, you know, that's, that's good value for a guy with, uh, you know, who has fought nobody good, who is completely untested. He's coming from, you know, an area of the world where, you know, MMA is not very prominent. So he could certainly come in here and get tested by Safarov and wilt on his. His first real test so that's certainly a possibility of happening and but the pick is going to be uh negramanu probably to get this one done by tko in the second round the next fight takes place in the lightweight division we have mark diacasey who is 12 and 3 taken on joe duffy who is 16 and 3 the opening betting line for this one was joe duffy as the minus 265 favorite to mark diacasey at plus 185 Looking over at our affiliated sportsbook, 5dimes.eu, we see Joseph Duffy at minus 175, Dia Casey at plus 155. So where the line sits out now, I think, is much more appropriate than where it opened up. You know, Duffy at minus 265 or something like that is pre- pretty wide. I wouldn't say it's that lopsided of a fight, you know, but uh, I do favor Duffy in this one. Uh you know, Dia Casey is coming off of that three, uh, coming off a three-fight skid. He's lost three in a row. You know, competitive fights. He hasn't looked terrible on them, but you know, he's definitely got some flaws, and it seems like there's a little bit of a blueprint to beat him. And um, you know, his 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 ground game is not very good at all. You know, he's he's sort of easy to take down. He doesn't have good jujitsu or good get-ups. You know, he was uh, losing that fight to Dan Hooker the, uh, for the first two rounds, and then for some reason shot for his own takedown, and then was submitted immediately. Uh, Dick Casey's other big weakness seems to be with the leg kicks. You know, he doesn't really seem to check leg kicks too well, and Jakar Close really exposed that. Uh, and Nasrat uh, Hakrapes did as well in his, in the most recent fight, so... You know, he's uh, he started off in the UFC as, you know, the bone crusher. The dude with the cool mohawk was <clears throat> knocking people's out. He had really good flashy taekwondo kicks, like spinning kicks and all types of crazy stuff. And he also had some real power in his hands. But, you know, it turns out he's only really a, a good fighter when he's moving forward. He does not do good when he's moving backwards. He doesn't f- fight well off his back foot at all. He doesn't do good with pressure you know so fighters like uh, Nasrat and Drakkar Close and you know those guys have were just pressuring him and then beating him you know you know decisively but this fight for Dave Casey is, is certainly a winnable one he's fighting a guy who will uh, you know definitely be willing to strike with him even though Duffy's got a pretty solid ground game he's got good jiu-jitsu I think this one will uh, be contested mostly on the feet Duffy might ch- try to change levels if he doesn't you know like what's going on on the feet but I think the Duffy will you know actually have some success on the feet in this one he, I believe he comes from an amateur back, uh, boxing background of his own right possibly even pro he's got really fast hands a uh, really good jab and he, he works the body really well too he digs to the body with those punches but he hasn't fought in uh, over a year and a half I believe since November of 2017 that fight against James Vick you know he looked he looked good in that fight he, in the first round he won that fight and then looked like he started to struggle with the range of Vic Vic started kicking more uh, and then it looked like all of a sudden Duffy just lost his range he like he looked like in the first round he really had Vic's number and was uh, touching him up with his punches but in the second round the, the fight totally changed you know his output dropped off and his defense got a little worse you know he always keeps his hands pretty low does joe duffy but it you know when uh you can do that when you have good gas tank you know, good cardio when you're fresh but in the rounds one but uh, once you start to get tired rounds two and three you know when keeping your hands low your reaction time is going to slow and you're going to start getting hit more so uh you know duffy's takedown defense is not good at all of his own right but uh day casey probably will not look to change levels in this one but a huge factor in this fight is that Joe Duffy trains at TriStar with Nasrat Hakrapas, the man who just beat Mark Diacasey, who, you know, the, the Frost Sahabi developed a great game plan to pressure Diacasey and, you know, pressure with him with uh, leg kicks and boxing and that stuff that, you know, Joe Duffy is certainly 
capable of, of executing that same game plan. You know, Nasrat has, uh, I believe, better output and better uh, cardio than Duffy. But, you know, if Duffy, you know, saw that fight with his, his training partner and defeat him and he knows the game plan is there, I really would expect that TriStar prepared him uh, equally as they did uh, Nasrat. And uh, Duffy is ready to execute that game plan, you know, uh, be leg kicking and jabbing for 15 minutes if need be. But, you know, look for Dia Casey to be, go out there and, you know, uh, look to save his contract the dude has lost three fights in a row he's pretty much going to get cut if he does not win this fight so look for him to you know get reckless and if he's losing this fight he might bite down on his mouthpiece and just swing away because he knows that that knockout could be his only chance to save in his contract so uh you know if dk is able to start uh, start quick and start dictating the pace of this fight in the first round he has a good chance of making it a competitive fight but if he goes down one round to zero uh, you know, I, I could see Duffy taking over in this one, but D. Casey has had close fights before. You know, he was 1-1 uh, going into the Frankie Perez fight and then was able to dig deep in that third round and uh, pull out the victory in that one. So he does have the ability to, you know, dig deep. He does have the ability to, you know, show off his cardio and win in the latter half of the fight. But, you know, I just, I, I got to side with Joe Duffy in this one. I think that if the fight does start to, you know, not go his way, I think that there is a chance that he tries to level change and use his jiu-jitsu to get a submission that is you know i'd say dia casey's biggest weakness uh along with you know getting pressured of course but uh you know i just gotta side with joe duffy i think he has more ways to win this fight i think he could uh win it by decision or submission while you know uh D i guess dia casey could win by knockout or d decision of his own right but i just i i favor joe duffy slightly in this one uh you know if you if you bet uh Mark Dia Casey at a little bit higher odds than he is now. I think he was up to plus 175 or something somewhere along. Yeah, one one. He got as high as you know 195. Look, it looks like at some points that's a good price. You know, he's been steadily dropping the past uh the past four or five days. Where the price is at now, yeah, I would say you know it's definitely dog or pass at this point. But I don't know. I would I would skip the the bet on Dia Casey in this one. I just think that uh, his IQ is a little bit uh, lacking, and even though he's his back against the wall in this one, he could get cut with a loss. I don't really think he has that that uh, that awareness to you know go out there and make this one happen. So I think that Joe Duffy won this one by decision. Next fight in the featherweight division, we have Arnold Allen, who is thirteen and one, taking on Jordan Rinaldi, who is fourteen and six. The betting line for this one opened up Arnold Allen as the minus 290 favorite to Jordan Rinaldi at plus 210. Looking over at our affiliated sportsbook, 5dimes.ubc, Allen minus 135, Rinaldi plus 115. So a ton of money coming in on Rinaldi, pushing him from 210 to plus 250, or excuse me, he went from plus 210 to plus 115. So... Uh, like I said, a massive amount of money coming in on Jordan Rinaldi, and 100% rightfully so. The people who got Rinaldi at plus 210, congratulations to you. That's going to be a hell of a line uh, looking back at it after this weekend. I can't believe they actually set that line that that, uh, that high, but regardless... Uh, Arnold Allen coming off of uh, you know an interesting fight you know a fight that he was losing he was getting out grappled for the first you know two and a half minutes of that fight versus Mads Brunel uh, a jiu-jitsu black belt and then all of a sudden Arnold Allen cinches up a choke in round three and taps the black belt out with a front choke you know it was super impressive not only the choke itself but the fact that he was able to stay in that fight mentally after losing the grappling exchanges getting you know taken down repetitively and having a really tough fight up until that point but that didn't matter he stayed he stayed uh confident in himself and he ended up getting that tap so impressive performance from him despite him losing but the way he was losing that fight is why i am picking jordan rinaldi in this fight you know he was going against a jiu-jitsu guy and mads brunel who has you know good takedowns uh, but you know, he, he lacked a little bit of top control. Uh, you know, he was, uh, Allen was able to get back to the feet and, you know, uh, make the, the striking, uh, exchanges a little bit. Even Allen is, you know, he's a pretty, a pretty good striker. He, uh, he's got a lot of movement. He's always bouncing around on his feet. He's got good, good kicks. Uh, throws a lot of front kicks. He's constantly throwing, you know, teeps to your body to keep you at range. But, you know, look, look for uh, Jordan Rinaldi to catch one of those kicks and put Allen on his back in this one. I don't think Allen, uh, Allen will be throwing many kicks at all in this one. I think that he'll be uh, primarily boxing. But, uh, you know, the thing about... Uh, 
Arnold Allen is, he, he does well defending the takedowns against the cage. When he has the cage against his back, he does well, you know, digging for underhooks and, you know, using that wizard or getting taken down and bouncing right back up to his feet. He did that a few times against uh, Brunel, but when he gets taken down in the center of the cage, that is when, you know, the, he has problems. He can get put on his back and, you know, knock it, knock it up at that point. So look for Rinaldi to be blasting takedowns. This guy's got extremely good wrestling. He's good, got great top pressure, good sub defense good ground and pound you know you saw you saw that in his last fight on on, uh, on full display against Jason Knight who's got a great jiu-jitsu uh, background of his own the guy's got you know I don't know if he's a black belt at 10 planet but he's got a good rubber guard uh, you know he's got good submissions and, and you know Rinaldi was able to be on top he was able to avoid the submissions he was able to land ground and pound and despite um uh, Despite Hick Diaz, uh, Jason Knight, excuse me, uh, threatening with submissions off of his back, which, you know, you can win a fight uh, a round off of your back if you're threatening with submissions. Rinaldi was being just as active with the ground and pound and his guard passing. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, uh, Rinaldi, in this matchup just favors him. I think that Rinaldi will get the takedowns. You know, uh, Arnold Allen's takedown defense is, is, like I said, it's it's decent against the cage, but in, in the center of the cage, it's not very good. It seems like he's kind of content to get uh, takedown at some points. Uh, and, you know, but I think Rinaldi will be blasting for the takedowns. I think he'll get on top, and I don't think he's going to give Allen any space to get up or any space to, you know, get back to his feet like Mads Brunel was. I think that Rinaldi will be, uh, you know, heavy on top and be keeping he, he's huge for 145 he's you know former lightweight uh rinaldi dropped down to 145 and i think the size will really show in this fight if uh alan is able to get back to his feet in this one it's going to be interesting because uh i think alan will get taken down no matter what at some point in the fight unless he you know knocks out rinaldi in the first couple exchanges but uh you know rinaldi is certainly hittable on the feet we've seen uh we've seen guys tag him up on the feet a little bit so you know look for alan to uh make this fight interesting if he's able to get up on the feet in this one but i don't think he will uh, or you know he might get up a few times but i think he's going to be exhausted from the grappling exchanges i think that you know he will learn that rinaldi's top pressure his takedowns are you know a different level than mads brunel and i think that rinaldi will get this one done by decision so the pick is going to be rinaldi and you know if uh he's an underdog still plus 115 you know get in there get in there you know i think i got him at plus 125 uh you know i think he's, he'll probably end up being my biggest bet for this car but I'm, you know i'm confident in him and i think that he will win and uh do it fairly easily as well so the next fight in the middleweight division we have Jack Marshman, who is 22 and 8, taking on John Phillips, who is 21 and 8. The opening betting line for this one is Jack Marshman at minus 175, favor to John Phillips at plus 135. Right now, over at our affiliated sportsbook, 5 dimeseu we see Marshman at minus 155, John Phillips at plus 135. So, uh, hell of a hell of a shit show to kick off the main card. On ESPN Plus in this one, we got two. You know, these guys are, are close to mirror images of themselves. They're both Welsh. They're, you know, 22-8 and eight versus 21-8. and eight. They both are, you know, boxers. They both have bad ground games. They're both, you know, pretty chubby, pretty hittable, not too technical. You know, very, very uh, uh, mirror images of, of one another in this one. So, uh, you know. Uh, Marshman, he's got he's got some decent boxing. He comes from an, uh, an amateur boxing background, but you know it's it's you can't even really tell honestly. He's his his striking looks pretty sloppy. Uh, you know he, his defense is not bad. You know he just uh, you know survived a fight against Carl uh, Carl Robertson where you know he was outstruck in that one, losing a decision. He was also taken down in that one uh, multiple times. He does not look very good off his back at all, but he doesn't have to be real worried about that too much in this one. John Phillips also has a horrible ground game, looks terrible off his back. I don't think either gentleman will attempt to take down. Actually, Mar Jack Mar or Jack Marshman, even though he's had 10 fights in the UFC, has never attempted a takedown, which is, you know, remarkable that pretty much he's He's all of his fights are on the feet, and he's you know content with them being on the feet. He only has five fights in the UFC, not ten. But 
you know, he uh, he had a he had a decent showing against Thiago Santos. He, he, that was a competitive fight. He actually dropped Santos in that fight before, you know, Santos eventually knocked him out in the second round. But, you know, dropping a guy like Santos goes a long way. You know, he's a very uh, good striker. You know, that was at 185 when he was much more chinny than he is now at light heavyweight. But that's beside the point. You know, Marshman's definitely got some hands on him. You know, Phillips does too, though. They both, he's got, both these guys are going to be swinging, swinging wild. Uh... And, you know, one of these guys will probably get knocked out on this one. So, you know, Phillips Phillips had a lot of success against, you know, regional guys, uh, you know, cage warriors in England and whatnot and knocking dudes out and, and small, you know, high school gymnasiums and stuff like that. But he, he's looked really bad in the UFC so far. He was taken down and submitted uh, control in almost every second of that fight versus Charles Bird. He really struggled with uh, Kevin Holland in their most recent fight was uh, really struggled with the kicking game of Kevin Holland, just really couldn't close the distance at all on the feet, and uh, wasn't able to get his boxing going, and then eventually was taken down and submitted again by Kevin Holland. So the, the, the ground game of Phillips is by far his biggest weakness, and... You know, but he doesn't have to be worried about that at all in this one. Jack Marshman never ta- attempting a takedown in his uh, five UFC fights. I doubt he will in this one either. I think, like I said, I think this one will be contested on the feet. Both these guys are going to be winging punches. You know, look in this one. If Marshman gets his back caught on the cage, if Phillips is able to, you know, control the pace of this one, I think Phillips will probably uh, either knock Marshman out or possibly win a decision you know Phil, you know phillips's cardio looks pretty bad he is not very uh you know disciplined he's not very technical at all so i don't really favor him to win a decision at all i think if this one goes to the cards it will be marshman winning look for marshman to keep this one at distance you know use his jab not not try to you know engage in the pocket that would be the smart game plan for marshman to to to, to box with a jab to stick and move to you know not get caught against the cage but that's probably not what he's going to do he doesn't have good iq he's not a very smart fighter he will probably he i don't think these two gentlemen like each other one another one uh much they've you know definitely known each other for a long time coming from the same small country being in the same weight class having the same style so they definitely have you know probably had uh each other on their radars for a while so they're probably will stand and bang in this one and you know that's going to give phillips the fight that he wants phillips is definitely the i'd say the better brawler i think he will uh it'll be interesting it really will uh, i gotta side with marshman just because phillips is, is so bad I think Marchman has, you know, had the, you know, obviously he's had the better success in the UFC, and he's the better technical fighter all, all around. So I, the pick is going to be Marshman. Next fight in the welterweight division, we have Danny Roberts, who is 16 and three, taking on Claudio Silva, who is 12 and one. The opening betting line for this one is Claudio Silva the minus 180 favorite Danny Roberts the plus 140 underdog right now we see Claudio Silva minus 150 to Danny Roberts at plus 130 so uh, I, honestly I, I don't agree with where this line is set at all I, I actually cap Danny Roberts as a small favorite in this one you know Claudio Silva definitely has a way to win and that is by submission but that's really the only way i see him getting this fight done i think that uh you know danny roberts is you know certainly the much better striker he's a former pro boxer he's got really fast hands he trains with uh henry hoof down in south florida with a lot of you know high level guys and you know the 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 training partners that he has are going to come into play big time in this matchup you know commander usman just got done his fight camp for his uh tyron woodley down at uh Hard Knocks, uh, Michael Johnson is in fight camp right now, Michael Chandler is in fight camp right now, I believe, and Robbie Lawler just got done his fight camp for Ben Askren, which was totally revolved around uh, takedown defense and wrestling, so I imagine those guys at the Hard Knocks have been wrestling like crazy, you actually can, you know, they document a lot of their training there, those guys are, you know, savages, uh, they, they go hard in training, and they, they really, really pay attention to wrestling, which is, you know, a, a huge weakness for a lot of fighters, so it's good to see the Roberts, you know, coming from the, uh, the UK, knowing his ground game is probably not up to par he's working on it and he's he's uh he's you know he's good off his back honestly you know you saw him get uh, taken down by nathan coy then he triangled nathan coy off his back which was really surprising you know 
But, uh, you know, the, where Roberts has to be careful on this one is that he overextends himself on, on his combinations sometimes. Sometimes he'll leap in with a 1-2 and his, you know, his... his his footwork is not, you know, completely underneath him, and he'll get taken down, which is what, which is what you should look for Claudio Silva to do in this one. You should look for, uh, maybe not his own, maybe not shoot his own takedown, but look to, you know, change levels when Roberts is going for the punches on the feet. So, you know, Claudio Silva's takedown or uh, takedowns are just bad, man. He's really desperate with them. He he leaps in and he, you know, he'll desperately grab one of your legs or something like that but he he somehow finishes them you know he'll like i said he'll look really ugly leaving himself open for strikes coming into the takedown but he'll somehow get a hold of your leg and get you down and once he's got you on the ground he's got excellent jujitsu man this guy passes your guard he'll he'll mount you he'll take your back he'll do whatever and he'll he's got submissions from all over you know we saw in his most recent fight against Nordin Taleb coming off of a three-year layoff as a three-to-one underdog in that fight, and you know he's getting tagged up on the feet, but all he needs is one takedown. He takes him down, and and Nordin Taleb got submitted in that one. You know Taleb's fucking IQ is pretty bad. You know that was on full display in that fight. Him trying to submit uh, Silva instead of getting back to his feet with that leg lock. So uh, you know Silva kind of caught a break in that one and kept. Um, Nordin Taleb on his back when Taleb could have gotten up, but Roberts is not going to do that. He's not going to, you know, mess around on the feet. He's just going to try to get right back to his, uh, right back to his feet. He's got really good get up skills. He doesn't, he, his takedown defense is not very good, but he, he, he'll get up back up to his feet. He's really strong, uh, getting up to his feet and, you know, but what worries me a little bit about Roberts and, you know, I do have a little bit of action on him in this one, but what's preventing me from, uh, betting more on him is that when he fought David Zawada in, uh, his most recent fight, he got almost submitted a few different times, you know, now Zawada wasn't exactly close to finishing these submissions, but he certainly threatened with them. You know, he was, uh, I don't remember the exact ones. I think it was, I definitely remember a leg lock and then, you know, there were a few other submissions that Zawada briefly attempted, maybe a guillotine or an arm bar. But, you know, you can't you can't be, you know, messing around with that shit against Claudio Silva. If if Roberts gave, uh, you know, Silva the same opportunities he gave Zawada, there's a really good chance that Silva submits him in this one. So as a pick, I, I got to go with Roberts, I think, and, you know, and a, and a bet, too, you know, considering that he's plus 130, I think he should be the favorite. Uh, I think that Roberts will, you know, stuff most of the takedowns. He will, you know, punish Silva on the feet with his, with his, you know, striking. He's got really powerful striking. I think that if Roberts is able to uh, stuff a few takedowns, he will eventually knock out Silva on the feet. But if Silva is able to, you know, get a good entry to a takedown or ch change levels off of a striking combination from Roberts and, you know, get that mount, I think that's a wrap. He, he should probably submit Roberts if he gets, you know, in a dominant position like side control mount or the back. So, you know, a good way to play this fight, I think, is betting on Roberts' uh, money line at plus money. I think Roberts can win by knockout or decision if this one good to the cards. But I really think Silva's only way uh, that he can win this fight is via uh, submission. I don't see him uh, being, you know, uh, I don't see him getting takedowns in all three rounds, winning the rounds that way. And, you know, I certainly don't see him getting a knockout because his striking is terrible. So, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I really do lean towards knockout for, for Danny Roberts in this one. You know, you just see the way that uh, Silva uh, strikes his, his uh, you know, Leon Edwards was making his UFC debut five years ago and was tagging Claudio Silva with multiple left hands in that fight. So if that if that is, you know, any indicator, Roberts is going to be, you know, whipping that piston of a left hand into Silva's face nonstop, and you'll probably get the knockout in this one. So the pick is going to be Roberts to get it done by a second or third round knockout. The next fight takes place in the Bantamweight division. We have Nathaniel Wood, who is 15-3, taking on Jose Alberto Quinoez, who is 7-2. The opening betting line for this one was Nathaniel Wood as the minus 265 favorite, Quinoez at plus 185. Right now, we are seeing Wood at minus 325 to Quinoez at plus 265. So a lot of money coming in on Nathaniel Wood, even as a sizable favorite already. You know, uh, I think he should be a favorite. I think where the opening line came out around minus 265, even that is a little steep. But 
I'd say it's justified, but where it sits at now, Nathaniel Wood minus 325, that is super, super steep, honestly. <clears throat> this is a, a guy, you know, who has looked really good in the UFC so far. Uh, you know, his, especially his most recent fight against Andre Yule, picking up that submission, he looked he looked really good in that fight. He was pretty much controlling the fight the entire time it lasted. But in his debut against Johnny Eduardo, didn't look so you know indestructible. You know, he did win that fight via Darce in the second round, but you know Eduardo was you know won the first round of that fight. He he rocked Nathaniel Wood really hard with some punches. You know, it, it, Nathaniel Wood's chin held up very well. You know, he looked like. Uh, he looked like, you know, hurt, but not, you know, too bad. Uh, he looked like he still had some defense in his wits about him, even though he ate maybe five hard right hands in a row. He's fighting a guy in Quinoez who doesn't really have much power on the feet, but he's, you know, he's a pretty technical striker, I'd say. He, you know, is more so of a point fighter. You know, he's real tall and long. You know, Wood's much shorter. Quinoez is going to have a big height and reach advantage in this one, I'd imagine. Uh, Quinoez is, you know, really led on the feet. He's bouncing around, throwing feints constantly. But his, his striking is a little mechanical. It's kind of, you know, predictable. Like, you might, you know, be able to time him. Or if you watch a lot of tape on him, you, and you might be able to emulate him almost perfectly. Because, like I said, he, he throws a lot of the same stuff. He comes out there looking looking the same almost every time. But, you know, he's got good cardio. You, you, you know, he's in the third round, looks fresh almost every fight. He has, you know, uh, fights to go to the decision a lot. But, he like I said, he looks, he looks very, uh, you know, refreshed in that round three so it looks like he can keep going some of his fights honestly he seems a little too tentative and it seems like he could you know unleash a little more of his power and strikes but he just doesn't uh but you know he's he stands really you know straight up it, it really you know it, it screams you know takedowns honestly it, he gets taken down you know quite easily and i think that you know obviously that's what where wood is going to be looking to take this this fight uh you know he was uh taken down by Joey Gomez and uh I think a few times in that fight you know he you know Quinoz's level of competition in the UFC so far has been very low you know uh Leandro Morales jo uh, Joey Gomez Diego Rivas Taruto Ishihara you know none of those guys are anywhere close to to top level uh, bantamweights you know, not saying Nathaniel Wood has fought the stiffest of competition yet, but I think Nathaniel Wood has fought the better competition. You know, he's coming over from Cage Warriors. He fought some, some really good guys over there. And, uh, you know, I'm just really impressed with Wood. I think that even if this fight stays in the feet, I think that Wood has a good shot of winning the, the, the stand-up exchanges. He's got, you know, really good boxing. He, he hits hard. He's got really good pressure, too. He'll be he'll be sticking you like glue the entire fight. He... he Wax leg kicks at people, man. He, he'll hit your calf right away. He was doing that to Andre Yule from the minute their fight started. So, uh, you know, look, Nathaniel Wood is just really well rounded. Like I said, he's, he he can he can mix it up well in the field. He'll pressure you. He'll take you down. Hit you with some ground and pound and submit you. And uh, you know, I, I do favor him in this fight. Uh, you know, I I would you know cap him minus two hundred, minus two fifty. But you know, Quinoa is at plus two sixty five. Man, he can easily you know stuff a few shots of, of wood. You know, make this fight um, competitive on the feet. You know, make it that point fighting type of fight that that Quinoa loves to fight. And you know, you might see you know Quinoa's edge out of decision. But you know, Nathaniel Wood. You know, uh, he is the English fighter in this one. The crowd will be behind him. He's gonna be. Looking Looking, uh, you know, entertain the crowd, come out there, making a decisive win. He's fighting a guy he can certainly finish in uh, Quinoez. You know, Quinoez has jujitsu tatted across his chest, so I imagine his jujitsu is pretty good. Even though we haven't uh, gotten to see it fully displayed in the UFC too much, so look for some good grappling exchanges in this one. You know, Nath Nathaniel Wood. Uh, he submitted uh, Johnny Eduardo, who's, you know, uh, a very experienced grappler of his own right. Uh, but Andre Yule, not really so much. His ground game is his biggest weakness. And, you know, Wood didn't have too much trouble cinching up the submission in that one. But look to, look for some exciting scrambles in this one. And if, you know, Quino is, like I said, Quino is could shock us. And he could have way better jiu-jitsu than we've, uh, we could have thought. Like I said, you, you got to have some good jiu-jitsu in order to get the shit tatted across your chest. But... I favor you. Uh, I favor Nathaniel Wood to get the win in this one, and uh, I, I imagine he'll get it done by decision, uh, not by finish. But there's certainly a chance he finishes them too. Next fight in the 
Light heavyweight division, we have Volkan Ozdemir, who is 15-3, taking on Dominic Reyes, who is 10-0. The betting line for this one opened up Reyes as the favorite at minus 215, Ozdemir at plus 165. Since then, more money coming in on Reyes, pushing him to minus 260, Volkan Ozdemir to plus 220. So, you know, Dominic Reyes has looked, you know, very impressive so far in the UFC. He's coming off of that, that the win over Ovin St. Pru. Actually, a common opponent between the two is Ovin St. Pru. And, you know, we're going to use a bunch of comparisons between those two fights uh, later on in, in our analysis. But, you know, uh, Dominic Reyes, you know, against Ovin St. Pru just won, you know, every second of that fight. It was just controlling the fight, you know, uh, you know, not dominating, you know, like 30 25 type uh, shit, but, you know, winning very comfortably every round. You know, winning the stand up exchanges, you know, his body kicks are really good. Uh, he, he's, his leg kicks are hard. He's got really, you know, good technical boxing. He got really powerful straight punches you know you saw that in the last the last second of the Ovin St. Pru fight even 14 minutes and 55 seconds into the fight he still had that power to be able to touch the chin of uh, OSP and you know completely uh, floor OSP the fight was not stopped by knockout but you know it probably could have been if yeah uh, but I see I see why uh, the fight was to stop, you know, the horn did go off and OSP got back to his feet. So it was not a knockout, uh, but still a very impressive decision win for Reyes. He showed that his cardio can go the full fi uh, full 15. And that was important. That was really important because he, before that, he, all of his wins came in the first round, except for uh, one win um, back in 2015 over a low, lower level opponent. But, you know, the fact that he could go in the UFC against a guy with, you know, some real submission skills, a guy who's, you know, fought, you know, John Jones has gone, the, he's been in five main events in the UFC, he's gone five rounds multiple times, has fought, you know, really high level competition in OSP. Dominic Reyes dominated OSP. He, you know, stuffed his takedowns. He's, you know, uh, he's just, he was just really, really impressive in that fight. And, uh, you know, his output does, I'd say, slightly drop off after round one. You know, I think he landed something like 60 strikes in round one against OSP and then 20 in round two and then 15 in round three or something like that. So his output does drop off pretty steeply. But uh, so does his opponent, Volkan Ozdemir. Volkan Ozdemir is, you know, a very dangerous striker on round one. He, you know, has knocked out uh, some really good guys. Jimmy Manoa, Misha Serkinov in round one with that, that you know, diddy bop to the back of the ear and the clinch. And then he, uh, you know, got rushed into a, a title fight with Daniel Cormier a little too soon. But he was he was game in that fight. You know, he came out throwing bombs at Cormier and definitely tagged Cormier with some with some real uh, hard shots. But you know, eventually was taken down a few times in that fight and you know just controlled on the ground by DC, who's you know got some of the best ground game in UFC history. So no shame in that one at all. Like I said, he was kind of rushed into that fight. He only had three fights in the UFC and uh, was you know kind of thrown in there uh, against DC. But uh, What's even, uh, I guess, a little more revealing in that fight is this fight against Anthony Smith. Anthony Smith is, you know, a, a tough, durable guy who's, you know, known for, you know, withstanding the early storm and then coming back and, you know, and finishing you. And he, that's exactly what he did against Ozdemir. You know, uh, Ozdemir was getting the better striking exchanges for the first, you know, round or two of that fight. Uh, he was definitely up two rounds to nothing. But then Anthony Smith took him down, took his back, and then choked him out in round three. So... That's, uh, you know, Ozdemir's ground game uh, definitely seems to be his weakness. His cardio is a big weakness. And, uh, but, you know, gr I do not think Dominic Reyes will, will be taking uh, Ozdemir down in this one. I think this fight will be contested uh, entirely on the feet. But uh, there, there's a huge difference between these two guys. Even though I said their outputs, you know, drop off, even though their cardio may not be the best, Dominic Reyes doesn't show that he's tired. You know, he in that fight against OSP, even though he his output was steadily dropping off and he was getting tired, he still remained, you know, very uh, you know composed in there. He was still, uh, you know, fighting off a jab, fighting with that leg kick. You know, showing good defense against OSP. O Ozdemir, on the other hand, was not. OSP was, uh, you know, starting to win round three versus Ozdemir. Uh, Ozdemir was getting tired. You could tell it. His he was dropping his hands. His you know his, his posture was you know slouching, and you could tell that he was tired. While Reyes, on the other hand, you know, uh, like I said, he fought. He you know kept his back straight. He uh, conserved energy, and he, he fought well while tired, and was able to win that decision comfortably. So that's going to be a huge factor in this one.
you know, I imagine both of them are, you know, improving their cardio is more and more fight to fight. So hopefully cardio won't be uh, an issue for either gentleman in this fight. Hopefully we get to see, you know, a, a closely contested kickboxing fight. But, you know, Reyes is just so much more technical on the feet. Ozmir wings punches with power. And, you know, he's got a bit of technique on the feet. He's good in the clinch. But, you know, I just think Reyes is going to be better everywhere on the feet. I think that he's going to be uh, working that body kick and that jab, giving Ozmir a lot of problems, keeping this fight at range where, Re where Reyes is going to shine and Ozdemir is going to struggle. If Ozdemir is able to get him against the cage and start landing hard shots in the clinch and, you know, uh, get that dirty boxing going and, you know, swarm Reyes early, I think that he has a good chance at, you know, possibly giving Reyes his first loss. But I think his, his window of opportunity is in the first round possibly in the first couple minutes he's gonna have to blitz Reyes like I said get that clinch going look to land those shots behind the ear in the clinch that he uh, knocked out Manawa and circling off with but I don't think that'll happen I think Reyes will keep it at distance and will uh will outstrike uh, Ozemir to a 15 minute decision possibly getting a late finish uh maybe rounds two or three if uh Ozemir's cardio is still not up to par so um, the pick is gonna be Reyes to get this one done and we have arrived at our co-main event and main event, two amazing welterweight fights. I really can't wait for these fights. I honestly think the co-main event actually might be a little more uh, enticing of a matchup than the main event. We got Leon Edwards, who is 16-3, taking on Gunnar Nelson, who is 17-3-1. The opening betting line for this one was Leon Edwards at minus 130 to Gunnar Nelson at minus 110. Currently looking over at our affiliated sportsbook, 5dimes.eu, we see Leon Edwards as the minus 130 favorite to Gunnar Nelson at plus 110. So uh, the line for Edwards staying the same while Nelson is up to plus 110 instead of minus 110. I don't really know how that works entirely. I think that the bet the sportsbook opens it up as a, you know, a pick em or a, you know, minus, minus money, minus money fight to, you know, cover themselves real quick. And then uh, the market, you know, adjusts the fight. So one fighter is an underdog and one fighter is the favorite. So uh, not going to act like I fully know how that works, but that's my hypothesis. So, you know, just an incredible matchup in this one. Uh, you know, I, I think Leon Edwards is the deserving favorite in this one. I think he has the better striking uh, by far. And I think that their ground game, you know, uh, their ground games are closer than my, uh, most people might think. Um we do have uh, Gunnar Nelson being, you know, one of, one of the best uh, jiu-jitsu practitioners in the UFC today. You know, I feel like I feel like I say this once a podcast or something like that, but he, he really does have, you know, excellent jiu-jitsu. Competed at the world championship level, and you know, he's, he's he uses it extremely well in the UFC. You know. I, I can't count the number of guys, uh, Brazilian guys mostly, who are you know world champion black belts or something like that, but they can't seem to implement their their uh, their jujitsu too effectively. You know, um, uh, Cesar Freira is you know having trouble with it lately, and uh, Sergio Moraes is another example. There's there's guys who you know unfortunately just can't show off their high level jujitsu, but Nelson has no problem with that. He, his jujitsu is on on display in pretty much every one of his fights. Uh, you know, sometimes he'll hurt you with the punch on the feet and then snatch a sub like he did versus uh, Brandon Thatch and Alan Joban. The way he finished Alan Joban was so precise and calculated. It's, it's, you know, one of the most underrated finishes ever. He rocks Joban uh, with a punch throws a kick on the way in and he's like you know what i don't want to i don't want to bruise up my shins i don't want to hurt my hands anymore i'm gonna drag you down to the canvas and snatch up a guillotine in five seconds flat like the whole he hurt him took him down and subbed him in 10 seconds it's just so high level that finish go back and watch that shit if you if you don't remember it gunner nelson versus alan joe ban but, uh, you know, Gunnar Nelson is, you know, tough as fuck. You saw that in his last fight. Uh, he was, you know, could have been losing to Alex, Alex Oliveira. He, you know, took Oliveira's back and Oliveira was able to escape at a position that, you know, no one has really escaped for from uh, Gunnar Nelson. Hope you don't hear the fire trucks too loudly in the background. Had a positive for there while the Philadelphia PD passes by. Uh, or the Philadelphia Fire Department, not PD. Um, but uh, getting back to the co-main event, you know, uh Gunnar Nelson's striking is, you know, he does have moments of success. He's got a really nice straight right hand with a lot of power behind it. But he also has moments where he's hittable on the feet, you know. 
Uh, the a big fight that comes to mind is Santiago Ponzinibbio. Despite the fact that he got eye poked in that fight, um, he you know was he was you know his chin got tested in that fight. He got he got rocked uh, pretty badly by Santiago and he got finished in the first round. So you know I, I, I'm that's one of the fights where I think the eye poke. Mm, might have had a, a bit to, uh, to play in it. Actually, the last time I remember it, uh, remember watching it, it didn't seem to be as much of a factor as I thought. Regardless of the eye poke, and, you know, a bigger fight where uh, Gunnar Nelson's striking defense is uh, his poor striking defense is on display is that fight against Rick Story. That fight, I believe, was it was it five rounds? Um, might not, I don't think it was. Um, Oh, no, it was five rounds, yeah. Uh, Gunnar Nelson versus Rick Story, five-round fight. Rick Story won that one by split decision. You know, it was a, you know certainly a close fight, but you saw Rick Story, you know, a guy who's not really known for his striking, get the better as the striking exchanges against Gunnar Nelson. So uh, I, I, if this fight is remains on the feet, uh, I, I, I see Leon Edwards having uh, not an easy time outstriking gunner nelson but i see him uh outstriking him comfortably uh you know leon edwards is striking is is so good you know i can't i was you know so impressed with the way that he beat Dallin cerrone he beat cerrone in you know all aspects really he was able to defend the takedowns get up when cerrone ever took him down and you know he was able to just completely out kickbox Dallin cerrone he was you know one of the be- one of the most technical strikers in the ufc right now or ever honestly you know he's got some of the best you know muay thai everything uh, and you know edwards was just looked incredible in there he uh you know had better muay thai than uh Cerrone in that fight he was you know getting the better of the clinch exchanges he was landing knees on the break elbows in the rake he sliced cowboy open with a an elbow early on in that fight which you know might have had a big effect in that fight so you know Edwards is just you know one of the most improved fighters that we've seen uh in the UFC over the past couple years you know he was getting taken down and you know kind of gassing out against Claudio Silva in his debut you know all of a sudden he was defending some takedowns winning round one against Kamaru Usman and then now all of a sudden homeboys on uh you know a five or six fight win streak I think picking up wins over over really high level competition Albert Tumanov Vicente Luque Brian Brian Barberina Peter about it down Cerrone those five names are impressive you know and um uh Gunnar Nelson also beat uh Albert Tumanov uh but you know I, I definitely think that Leon Edwards has had the better strength of schedule and he's beaten the better opponents for sure uh and like I said uh his fight against Sabata you know a black belt he was take you know he was winning the grappling exchanges versus Sabata he was sitting in Sabata's guard and smashing him with ground and pound that fight uh, you know, he, he was outstriking Vincente Luque, outstriking Cerrone. You know, he's he he's really, really high level Leon Edwards. His his takedown defense is not great. That's that's one thing that's interesting about this fight. Is that uh, Edwards is not really too concerned with defending the takedowns. The same, but his ability to get back to his feet is some of the best in the ufc i tweeted this earlier this week you see him versus kamara usman he got taken down five times versus kamara usman the ufc welterweight champion of the world and he got back to his feet five times you know it he was not usman was not really able to dominate people on the canvas like he has done again like he did against edwards you know usman just dominated tyron willie just dominated uh Damian Maya, all types of high level guys with great ground games and he was not able to do that with Edwards. Now Usman has gotten, you know, exponentially better since their first fight, but so is Edwards. So even I expected his get up game, his takedown defenses was even better than he was against Kamara Usman. So, you know, it's it's gonna be interesting. The takedown is gonna be the biggest thing uh to look for in this fight. You know, Gunnar Nelson has really good takedowns, good level changes. He's you know, he's going to be looking to get this fight to the floor, looking to, you know, pass guard, looking to get top control and looking to submit Leon Edwards. But Leon Edwards is tough to submit. You know, Claudio Silva had him mounted, had his back taken, and was still not uh, able to submit uh, Leon Edwards, and that was four or five years ago. So like I said, Edwards has just been continually to get continuing to get better 
I imagine he's gotten better in you know all aspects of the game. His his kickboxing is you know on full display. His improvements there, but I imagine his wrestling and his jujitsu are getting even better too. And that was on display in the Peter Sabata fight. So I think that anywhere uh, that even if this fight gets to the floor, I think the Edwards will be able to you know maybe get back to his feet, maybe be defensive on the ground, and you know look to uh, to sweep and get back to his feet. But you know Nelson, his top pressure is some of the best in the UFC. His guard passing is some of the best, and his submissions are some of the best so edwards is going to be in hot water if this fight gets to the floor but i think that edwards will use his kickboxing his range control his distance control and to keep this fight uh at range he'll use his get ups and his takedown defense to you know keep it off the floor uh you know he's going to be you know through you know Edwards is the thing that's interesting about this is Edwards uh, has a, uh, his kicks are a big part of his game. He's got really fast head kicks, body kicks, leg kicks, and you know that's going to he might not be throwing as many of those against Nelson because he's worried about getting taken down off of a kick. So that'll be something uh, to be uh, looking out for in this fight if Edwards is keep uh, you know keeps this fight primarily boxing uh, i still think he could win that way you know so edwards uh could get this one done by knockout he doesn't really hit too hard though you know he it could be like an accumulation type of knockout in rounds two or three or uh most likely he will get this one by decision so the pick is going to be the leon edwards in this one and in the main event of the evening in the welterweight division we have darren the gorilla till who is 17 one and one taking on jorge Jorge Gamebred Masvidal, who is 32 and 13. The opening betting line for this one was Darren Sill as the minus 245 favorite to Jorge Masvidal at plus 175. Looking over at our affiliated sportsbook, five dimes. You we see Darren Sill at minus 230, Jorge Masvidal at plus 190. So, um, uh, Two-way action coming in on this fight. Definitely more money coming in on Darren Till throughout the week. Even though, you know, both lines are steadily bouncing up and down a little bit. You know, Monzu Dahl is going from 220 to 190 to 170. You know, he's going all over the place. So, like I said, certainly two-way action coming in on this fight. And rightfully so. It's a really, really close matchup. You know, it could pan out a lot of different ways. Um, but, you know, Darren Till coming off of that that devastating loss to Tyron Woodley. He, you know, got his first championship uh, title shot in the UFC after you know working his way up through you know going five uh, five one and one in the UFC, and then he was you know just, like I said dominated by Tyron Woodley in that fight. He looked you know extremely tentative in round one. He threw one strike, uh, and uh, you know he came out in round two. Uh, looking way way more aggressive too aggressive because he got countered right away and dropped with a massive right hand from Woodley then he got some you know berated with ground and pound on the ground heavy elbows and then eventually tapped out with a darts choke in the second round of that fight so just uh you know that's the type of fight where you know you question when you question a fighter's mentality and on how he will recover from that we've seen guys you know think they're invincible coming into the UFC racking up a couple wins in the UFC and then they get a title shot, they lose dominantly, and then they're not the same in the next fight. I'm talking about Francis Ngannou, who was, you know, knocking dudes out, was 6-0 in the UFC, thought he was, you know, the best heavyweight in the world. All of a sudden, he gets taken down and dominated by Stipe Miocic. And in his next fight, he was, you know, tentative as fuck. He was scared to throw. He, you know, said he wasn't there mentally. He was rushed into that fight. He wasn't, you know, prepared for it. So, you know, Till did take, you know, a good six months off. Hopefully, his head is in the right spot. You know, he did talk about it earlier this week, saying that he thinks about that fight all the time, thinks about it every day. Day. he watches it constantly and it definitely affects him but he's using it as motivation to uh you know press forward and get better as a fighter but still it shows that 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 loss is still fresh it's still right not in the back of his mind it's in the front of his mind like i said he, he thinks about it every day you know he's getting pretty emotional talking about it and you can see why he he was coming in there knocking dudes out and he was you know just qu probably questioning why the fuck didn't i throw any strikes in round one i i really landed no punches throughout the entire fight i'm gonna get made fun of constantly i got you know hit with 20 elbows on the ground i got tapped out with a choke coming from a mile away uh, so, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff to, to be thinking about for Darren Till on this one, but 
it's not like he's facing a, a guy who's a surging prospect in Masvidal. Masvidal is a veteran who's, you know, towards the end of his career, who, you know, had one of his most mediocre performances of his career in his last fight against Stephen Thompson, you know, uh, a common opponent between the two. Thompson just, you know, outclassed Masvidal was, you know, kicking him, keeping him at range with the body kicks and the side kicks. And, you know, just outboxing Masvidal, which is really surprising to see. Masvidal's got some of the best boxing in the UFC. But, you know, his, Wonder Boy Thompson's hands were on full display in that fight. His angles, his power. You know, he actually knocked Masvidal down in that fight. Uh, maybe one, twice, actually. Definitely once for sure with that step-out right hand. that uh, um, Or step-out left. I don't even remember which hand because uh, Wonder Boy hits from both stances. got power in both hands. But, you know... That common opponent between the two is, uh, you know, might be, uh, might be something to look at. Miles Vidal, you know, like I said, just got outclassed in that fight. Maybe lost thirty twenty six to uh, Thompson, while Till had a very competitive fight. You know, a chess match of kickboxing in, in, uh, in that fight where he was actually able to drop Thompson in that the last round of that fight. But, you know. Uh, Till is, you know, he can be a counter puncher sometimes. Sometimes he can strike first. I think he's actually more successful as a counter puncher. I think he was trying to wait to counter punch against Woodley, and Woodley wasn't throwing any strikes. He was looking to grapple for a little bit and tire uh, Till out before he was looking to, you know, make his move in that fight. So, you know, but Till, when, when Till is landing first, when he, like he did against Cerrone, he dictated the pace of that fight, put Cerrone back against the cage, and he eventually TKO'd Cerrone uh, with that straight left hand, that, you know, nice elbow he landed, and that barrage of punches afterwards. But Till's straight left hand is, you know, is one of the best in the business. Uh, you know, it's got massive power behind that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting in this one. The, the, the uh, the striking exchanges in this one will be vi will be fairly close, I think. I, I slightly give an edge to Darren Till. Uh, actually, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say I give an, an edge to either fighter because even though Till, uh, you know, I'd say has more power, he might be the bigger guy in in the octagon that night. Masvidal's technique with his boxing, I think, is much better. Where this fight could get really interesting is if it ends up on the ground. You know, Masvidal has a very good ground game. He, you know, went the distance against Damian Maia. And Damian Maia said that, man, that dude had some of the best jiu-jitsu uh, out of anybody I've ever fought in the UFC. And that guy's fought some, you know, everybody, Damian Maia. So to get that compliment from Maia is, you know, a huge uh, feather in the cap of Masvidal. And uh, Masvidal can certainly, you know, uh, certainly wrestle, certainly get the fight to the floor, and possibly submit Darren Till. I don't think it's a very likely outcome, um, but you know, it's certainly a possibility. He, you know, he could, you know, get some takedowns and win rounds. He could just get uh, Till thinking about the takedowns and then start mixing up his boxing a little bit more. But that that takedown of Masvidal is something I would, you know, look out for in this fight. Um, you know, their uh, the the cardio is another uh, something that's going to be a big factor in this fight. This these uh both of these guys have uh, had you know minimal uh, some experience five rounds. Uh, Till went to five rounds against um, Thompson, and his cardio looked really good in that fight. But that fight was a very low intensity, low output sparring match. You know, both guys landed like a hundred combined strikes over twenty five minutes. So it's a uh, you know that that fight's not a really a good indicator, honestly. I think Masvidal would be pushing a much higher pace. Masvidal went the five rounds most recently with Benson Henderson, and he did not look good in the main event rounds, rounds four and five of that fight. But that fight had a lot more grappling in it. it was you know almost not primarily grappling, but I'd say half half grappling and striking with you know Benson Henderson a really high level guy on the ground so that's probably why Masvidal got tired he was defending takedowns you know getting off his back a lot in that fight so that's he's not gonna have to worry about that at all, at all versus Till Till is his ground game is you know pretty bad he uh his takedown defense isn't terrible but he, he once he's on his back he's pretty helpless he doesn't you know have much jujitsu at all uh and you know He's, uh, he's definitely gassed out in fights before. You know, Nicholas Dalby, he was winning rounds one and two of that fight. He gassed out in the third and then got 10 8 for the draw. His only uh, his only other non-loss besides the fights of Tyron Woodley. So, the cardio is going to be is going to be interesting in this one. Uh, but, I, I think that, uh, like I said, I think that Till's fight where his cardio looked good, it's going to be a much different fight. Masvidal's fight where his cardio looked bad, it's going to be a different fight than that. So, hopefully, like I said... N 
uh, earlier. And hopefully cardio is not a factor for either of the gentlemen. Hopefully they can go the full 25 minutes in a competitive uh, uh, boxing fight, pro- primarily boxing. Uh, but, you know, I think that Masvidal has got to get this one done by knockout. I really do. Or submission. Uh, you know, these judges in England are massively favored or, and biased for Darren Till. That was on full display in his fight versus uh, Stephen Thompson, a fight that Till... You know, I believe lost three rounds, maybe four rounds to one, but somehow the judges uh, still gave it to Till, probably because the arena was going crazy every time Till came close to landing a punch. It was dead silent every time Wonder Boy was winning, uh, was landing a punch. But uh, Wonder Boy was also injured, or got his knee injured earlier in that fight, and he admitted he was fighting, you know, tentatively to try to save his knee. Uh, while he was, you know, fully healthy versus Masvidal, which is why he, you know, looks so good in that fight. But this is going to be a hell of a main event. Uh, in terms of uh, who I favor to win, I, I, I got to... F- I got to go with Till in England. You know, I just think the fact that he's got the the hometown crowd behind him, he's motivated to go go out, uh, go back out there, and uh, get that win after coming off that devastating loss. He's, you know, the much younger guy. I think he's got the higher ceiling at this point in his career because Masvidal is a, a veteran on the outs of his career, but. Uh, in terms of the betting window, I certainly would not trust uh, Till at minus 230. The, the value is going to be on Masvidal, but, you know, it's going to be tough to finish uh, Darren Till. You know, uh, even though Woodley made it look easy, it's not, it's definitely not going to be easy. A lot, a lot of guys have tried and a lot of guys have failed. So uh, it's going to be a tough task for Masvidal to get this one done via knockout or submission. He's really going to have to be aggressive and go after it. Uh, because, you know, the judges are not going to give him any favors in this matchup. So if this one goes to the scorecards, I favor Till. If it ends inside the distance, I favor Masvidal. Um, so uh, the pick, though, I'm going to decide with Masvidal to get the upset on the dog, uh, even though I kind of believe deep down in my heart that Darren Till will win another, uh, you know, kind of, not lopsided, but another uh, unjust uh, decision, considering that, Jorge Masvidal is n- notorious for losing close split decisions, so that's just been a part of his career, and you know it's a very real possibility that that happens again on Saturday afternoon. So the pick is going to be Masvidal, but wouldn't be surprised if Till won the scorecards. So that is going to be all for the UFC London re- uh, analysis and prediction. Thirteen solid fights going down this Saturday afternoon, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And with that being said, we are going to uh, transition over to uh, the recap of the UFC on ESPN Plus Four card that went down this past weekend in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, we're just going to be quickly running through all these fights, recap and what happened in all of them, like we do at the end of every Martian MMA program. So. Starting things off, we had Alex White defeat Dam Rett. You know, lost. Uh, Dam Rett was able to win the first round of this one, and White came back and won the latter two rounds of this one. So a nice victory from him. Alex Moreno was able to uh, rock uh, Zach Otto on the feet and then finish him on the ground. Actually, I don't remember how this fight got to the ground, but uh, Moreno got uh, mounted on Moreno, uh, Otto and just pounded him out for the uh, ground and pound victory in the first round. Matt Schnell with a very impressive submission over Luis Smolka. Luis Smolka actually, you know, favored to get the submission his own, uh, of his own in this fight, but it was actually Schnell submitting Smolka in this one. So Schnell proved that he has a, you know, real legit ground skills to go along with his boxing, and he could be a real threat in uh, whatever division he ends up in, 35 or 25. Uh, Maurice Green won a split decision against Jeff Hughes, a really unmemorable fight. Uh, but, you know, Green came through as the underdog in that one. Grant Dawson defeated Julian Erosa. Don't really remember too much about this fight. Um, let's see. Yana Kunitskaya defeated Marion Renault. Wow. Uh, you know, Kunitskaya got her nose smashed in this one, completely broken. But she was able, was able to tough it out, survive round three, even though she lost, and was able to win on the scorecards rounds uh, one and two, and def- win this one by decision. So impressive performance from Kunitsky, and her toughness was on full display. Uh, Anthony Rocco Martin defeated Sergio Marais by decision. Um, you know, another not too memorable fight. A lot of these were same with Omari Alkmedov defeating Tim Boach. Another broken nose fight. Bro- Boach got his nose broken. You know, in the first couple minutes of this fight, and was able to tough it out for the decision. You know, losing very convincingly. Omari's uh, Ahmedov cardio and his, you know, his technique, his composure looked a lot better in this one. 
proved that he was able to win a, a fight over the 15 minute uh, interval, and you know looked you know looked much much improved from his Marvin Vittori uh, draw. Benil Daryush was uh, losing the first round against uh, Drew Dober. Actually looked pretty hurt against uh, Dober. Hit him with some pretty heavy shots, uh, and then he. It was a 10-8 in the first round for sure for, for Dober. And Daryush was able to come back in round two and get the arm bar finish. Really impressive. Come from behind victory from Benil Daryush. Uh, Blagi Ivanov uh, defeated Ben Rothwell by decision in a lot in a, in a fight that a lot of people thought was a robbery. A lot of, you know, uh, most people scoring this fight scored it for um, Rothwell. I think like 80% of people scored it for Rothwell, which is insane. The fact that judges can get it so wrong, but shit happens, you know. Uh, and probably the most exciting fight of the night, we had Nico Price defeat Tim Means via knockout. Man, what a back and forth brawl this was. Starts off with Nico Price rocking Tim Means, and then uh, Means quickly recovering. Started getting his uh, his boxing working of his own and started tagging up Nico Price with punches uh, for you know the middle of the round and then at the end of the round man Tim Means looked like he was hurting Price he was marching forward not paying attention to his defense and Nico Price that power man he just blasted a hook and uh, rocked Means dropped him and then finished him off with some nasty ground and pound to knock out Means in this one so incredible come from behind victory via Nico Price and you just can't count that dude out. Uh, he's got he's got some of the best pound for pound power in the UFC right now. Um, next fight, Elis uh, Zaleski dos Santos took down Curtis Melender and rear naked choked him in the first round. Very impressive uh, victory from him. You know, great game plan. You know, even though he could have probably had a uh, a competitive fight on the feet, Zaleski chose to play it smart, take his opponent down with a bad ground game, and get him out of there in round one. And in the main event, we had a hilarious fight between Junior Dos Santos and Derek Lewis. You know, JDS was, you know, willing to trade. You know, he was coming out there brawling. It really worried me. I thought Derek Lewis was actually going to clip him. I think Junior Dos Santos could have fought a much smarter technical fight over 25 minutes if he really wanted to, but. He just must have been confident in himself, knowing that uh, his defense and his chin was uh, was on point, knowing that Lewis was not a real threat to him, and he just you know marched forward and threw and threw out, you know bombs at Derek Lewis, hurt him with a spinning back kick to the body that had Lewis you know hunched over for a few minutes. That was a really strange sequence of events, and then eventually you know Dos Santos went back to the body and uh, and then TKO'd uh, Lewis with I think he uh, ended up rocking him with a punch and putting him away. Uh, with some ground and pound so impressive performance from the veteran junior dos santos there you can never count that guy out even though he's getting up there in age he's you know on a three or four fight win streak right now so working his way up uh back to the title for his you know fifth title shot or something like that so uh pretty decent night of fights of uh in wichita kansas and you know we got ourselves a hell of a card going down this weekend uh, taped the hell out of this card, you know, watched, uh, I counted 59 fights for the uh, UFC London card going down this weekend, so we put in the research and we're really looking forward to see how these fights play out, so that is going to be all for episode 53 of the Martian MMA podcast, and I will catch you guys next week before UFC Nashville, peace.